integration of black South Africans into the economy. Our universities are very integrated now. You know, universities that you know, formerly only saw 10 or 20 percent uh, of the students uh, as black students are now 50, 60, 70 percent uh, black. Quite substantial going forward. I think what's you know, quite interesting is that we've rolled out a, uh, a social grant system for poor South Africans. It's very extensive. Um, many South Africans now who are in poverty uh, now get a dollar terms are small, but in rand terms, an okay amount of money every single month. Of course, when you roll out this kind of dole or social security system, you make people reliant upon the state. And uh, it's a controversial issue, I know. Uh, far be it from me to say to a per poor person, you shouldn't get a check from the state. But at the same time, if you don't give incentives to look for work, uh, and you don't create an environment in which there are jobs, people become more and more reliant upon the handouts that they get from the state. So, you know, I leave it, you know, with you to judge whether that's a good policy or not. In part, it's good, and in part, it obviously creates its own sense of problems. On the international front, everybody, we have joined what's called the BRICS group of countries, Brazil, Brazil Russia, India, China, and then latterly South Africa. Uh, it's an informal grouping of heads of state, uh, say what you like about it, looking at these fine uh, luminaries uh, yeah. in the picture here. South Africa, therefore, has moved closer from a foreign policy perspective, closer to China. South Africa certainly has been reluctant to criticize Russia in terms of the current uh, invasion of Ukraine. Bolsonaro, of course, is no longer there. But nevertheless, you get the idea that there's an alternative grouping in the world that wants to counter the influence of the West. And South Africa, at least in terms of this grouping, seems to want to participate in that. What's interesting, just because I know predominantly an American audience here, um, that uh, President Biden is holding a Africa Heads of State meeting. I think it's very soon, in the next week, next week or two, um, when most African leaders are going to be present in Washington. It's an attempt certainly by the United States, to claw back, I think, some uh, relationship with much of Africa, which I'll tell you, uh, has been much the domain of the Chinese for the last decade or two. So we'll see how that pans out. Nevertheless, those are some of the issues that, that we've had, which I think are reasonable here in South Africa, not necessarily the last one that I've spoken to you about. Now, some of our challenges. This talk will end at 6 o'clock tonight when I talk about challenges. There's a big challenge. Our biggest challenge is trying to beat the New Zealand rugby team uh, at rugby time after time. The biggest challenge, you can forget about all of the rest. Uh, you've, just been, you've just been in Cape Town. All looks beautiful when you look at it from the ship. Um, if you go to Sandton in Johannesburg, which is the financial heartland, of the country all looks beautiful if you look at the view there um, if you go and buy property in Santon, beautiful homes um, but of course there's a very high degree of inequality in south africa and it would be remiss of me just to sort of be flippant about this because south africans are not flippant about it i mean this home this home is barely five kilometers from uh, this uh, favela or shanty town in alexandra just outside just just outside johannesburg um, and those who study uh, inequality around the world obviously always point to South Africa because we have some of the highest inequality rates anywhere. I could, of course, show this if I was doing a talk on Brazil, for that matter, or Mexico, for that matter. But the South African story from an inequality point of view is, is, is very acute. Uh, you could just see a South African, typical South African middle class or upper middle class leafy suburb and a shanty town or favela here. Um, very close bordering, and you can just see the, the living condition um, uh, contrast. Um, now, from a, an economic growth point of view, I told you I'm going to give you a chart or two that's going to dazzle your eyes, by the way, so don't worry too much about it. This is growth, growth expected for African countries over the course of this year into next year, more or less this year. Right, come down right to the bottom. And there you will see South Africa growing at 1%. 1% GDP growth expected for this year, more or less. That's low. We are an underperforming major economy. You can see the rest of the African economies looking substantially better than South Africa. And uh, just by way of interest, Mozambique expected to grow 3.4%. Tanzania, 4% or so where you've been. And the star performer always up there, Rwanda, at about 6% or so. So South Africa underperforming in terms of growth. We had a terrible COVID decline in our growth rate. We've come back 
But the disappointment is, again, that we haven't been able to maintain a really good growth to, uh, recovery going forward. And one of the big problems for us is that we haven't got enough South Africans working. We have an acute economic problem in South Africa with about 47% of South Africans now unemployed. Hmm. 47%. Oh, man. Uh, now, uh, you can imagine, 47% unemployed means 47% who are drawing money, by and large, from the state, a drain on the state, and 47% who are not contributing to the state, who are not paying tax effectively. Some of them are involved in the informal economy, but whether or not they contribute to the state through the informal economy is very difficult to ascertain. So it's a critical issue for us. And actually, frankly, if you were doing a talk on South Africa, to me, unemployment remains the real issue because so many other issues flow from it. Social unease, crime, um, the dislocation of families. I mean, all of these issues uh, stem from unemployment. And again, South Africans have a rather strange sense of humor, everybody. Um, this is from one of our most famous cartoonists in Cape Town. Teacher says to the kids, so what would you like to be? And the kid says, employed. And I think you know, it's a sad cartoon, but it does, it, it, it does sort of give you an idea of some of this key challenge for us going forward. From an educational point of view, we find a lot of our younger kids don't complete their school leaving certificate. They drop out. They drop out in the grades 8, 9, 10, and 11. And it's a major problem for us if we want to be a modern economy with a skilled workforce. All of these issues compounded uh, are compounded, therefore can result in unrest, which we have seen uh, in part in South Africa over the last few years. We have a very active trade union movement, of course, that are politically involved and politically linked to the governing party. And that also can uh, sometimes, um, it sometimes means, means that the state has to spend more on the compensation for workers to keep the trade union movement on board. And that is also a challenge for South Africa. There's a challenge in terms of land and land ownership in South Africa. But it would be remiss of me to mention that one of the biggest challenges for us has been a decade, a decade of corruption within this country that has really cost South Africa. And what we should have gained in terms of growth has really been, has really been squandered. Our president said that the corruption cost to South Africa over the last nine years or so has been 34 billion US dollars. This mm. is not me saying this. This is our president of South Africa mm. right now. And when you have corruption to that degree, the corruption takes place in many of our big state-owned enterprises, like our electricity company called ESCOM. And, uh, uh, you know, when you have corruption in an electricity company, well, you again know what happens. You cannot keep the lights on. When you have corruption in our railway network, which is state controlled, you don't get the trains to run properly. Uh, when you have corruption in our post office, you don't get the letters and parcels delivered. And that's really affected uh, the delivery from state institutions in South Africa over the course of the last decade or so. Now, to our credit, our current president appointed the Chief Justice of South Africa to investigate corruption over the last 10 years or so, Chief, Zon, Chief Raymond Zondo. He has completed a tome of work outlining in detail corruption, and we are starting to see now, at last, some sort of fight back against corruption within the country. Senior officials who have been involved in all sorts of nefarious activities are starting to appear in court. Our prosecuting authority is starting now to uh, do their work and open dockets on all of these various individuals. And those involved in corruption are slowly being brought home, being brought to book. So, that's a credit to us, given the political difficulties that actually are mired in all of this. But it doesn't mean to say that uh, the damage hasn't been done in South Africa. For those of you who've been there for a few days, you know that we've got uh, energy problems within the country. We can't keep the lights on. We have what's called power blackouts, or what we call load shedding. And in the last, uh, well, we've had it for most of this year, for that matter, two to four hour blackouts per day 
in a staggered basis across all of our cities. So uh, it's obviously uh, a drain on our economy. And frankly, if you can't keep your lights on in a reliable fashion, obviously you're going to find this affecting small business in particular. And that also affects our broader economic growth. Once again, South Africans have a rather strange sense of humor. And I must just tell you that currently, as, as you sit here, um, our president is in London, and he has been received by King Charles. It's the first official state visit under the new King Charles in uh, London. And of course, one of our great comedians put this little <laughs> thing out that um, if you haven't got enough, <laughs> I couldn't resist putting it up because we laugh at these things. And I suspect that our president will also laugh at that. Um, now, he's got a concerned look on his face, and I'm coming to the end of the story. He's got a concerned look on his face um, for all of the reasons that I've spoken about. Um, but in particular, because he's going to face a major election, our national election, the next one, 2024. And the opinion polls for his political party look the worst that they've ever been. You don't have to worry too much about the charts there. All I can tell you is that if an election was held today, it's very possible that the African National Congress, the much venerated party of liberation, may not get 50% of the vote in our proportional system, which would mean they would need a coalition partner in order to govern. This is a big deal for South Africa that has not had a change of government in the last 28 years or so, and had not had a change in government in the previous 50 years. And here's the poll that would really, I think, worry our president. South Africans were asked whether they believe the country is moving in the right or wrong direction. 74% of South Africans say it's moving in the wrong direction. If you're the leader of the biggest political party, you don't want to see that particular statistic. So there are many unanswered questions about the country. Do you really think I was going to answer the question fully? Um, I'm an analyst, for goodness sake. You're not going to get a full answer, but you've, you've got enough here to see the challenges here. There's, a, there's enough to see the challenges. The really question is, can South Africa, can we, can we move from a, a, a country dominated by one political party to a much more um, flexible political system? Can we actually tolerate that democratically? It's a very important issue. We don't have experience in being ruled by different parties in successive elections. Will a, uh, a loss for the African National Congress, will it be uh, agreed? Will, will, will the African National Congress uh, uh, agree uh, if they have lost an election? Or will they find fault with the voting or electoral system? Ah, I hear a rumbling. Rumbling in the audience, but I'm not getting involved. I'm not getting involved, I promise you. Um, nevertheless, for South Africa, this is a real issue because we haven't got experience with that. And that's a test for our democracy. And of course, can we become globally competitive? Can we change our economic policy thinking? Gosh, we've got to get away from thinking that the state can do things because the state hasn't been able to do things in South Africa at all. And can we improve our skills base from a, you know, a, a, a problematic position where those young kids just don't have the right skills? So everybody, it's an exhausting story, is all I can say. South Africa is not a place that you relax in, other than when you're watching game drives and having a glass of wine. Um, but it's a fascinating, a fascinating country to watch as we go forward. We are learning. We're going to get some of it right. We're going to get a lot of it wrong as well. We've come a long way. I always believe that. We've, I've lived through these periods of uh, unrest and uprisings in 1976. Look, we're a more integrated country than we have been before. Uh, we, of course, are a proud sporting nation, as you know, and we do win occasionally at sports that we are good at. Um, and, you know, there's been a degree of nation building in South Africa, which is rather nice to see. But I have to say that when, you're, when your state has been so mired in inefficiencies and corruption, it takes away a bit of the gloss. It takes away a bit of that sort of romanticized uh, picture of, of, of South Africa. And I hope that with uh, the current president, with a much more competitive political system that I think we're going to have, we may well see a very different South Africa emerge over the next decade or so. And I certainly hope that that's the case. For many, in, for many who've lived in South Africa or have observed us from afar, they've often said South Africa is an impossible case, an impossible case, we're going to write it off. Look, we've been written off before and we've come back. So I'm going to end this little presentation on suggesting that the glass still remains half full for me 
given that I live in South Africa and I pay my taxes in South Africa, anything is possible. And I do think that a substantial political change is going to happen in this country that hopefully will steady what has been a very rocky ship for the last decade or so. Thanks very much for listening.